Welcome to Thick Boy Fight Club. I'm your Balkan boy. I am Andrew the Beast Tyson. And um, today we have a very special guest I'm very excited about, uh, Mr. John Malkovich. <laughs> and uh, uh, in, uh, in honor of one of my favorite movies of yours, uh, being John Malkovich, here's a uh, painting of John Cusack. <laughs> That's actually, I, I fucking love this. <laughs> I really, really love this. Say anything, baby. Say anything. Also, I look, I look like John Malkovich the way you look like Don King. <laughs> okay. I don't know what that means, but I'm rolling. It's the it's the hair. It's a, it's a little bit the hair. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Like, See, I've been. Can I, can I? This is. Are we still video saying this is fucking awesome? And it's called Radiohead. <laughs> Come on. Reaction right. was better than I thought. Do I get to take this home for real or just? <laughs> Welcome to Thick Boy Fight Club. This is your Balkan boy. I'm Andrew the Beast Tyson. And today we have a very special guest, uh, Mr. Roy McDonald, uh, former professional MMA fighter, um, coach to some of the highest level uh, combat athletes we've had produced in Canada. And um, yeah, let's get into it, Roy. John Malkovich stunt double. <laughs> I appreciate I love your work for it. You said it's like I love your you, look like, you look like John Malkovich, but fit. You know, like you yeah. could probably you could probably take, look a, take a punch. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, there we go. Thank you for right. noticing. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, Rory. So um, we we couldn't wait to have you on the show. You're one of the most interesting guys we talk to in really? terms of your concepts for 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 combat and um, your philosophies on the art of war and the most efficient way of fighting. So I figured. Um, let's start with how you got into martial arts and what kind of your journey's been, if you could summarize, and then we'll get sure. into it. Sure, you know, it, it's, I mean, this is, I'm sure this is a conversation you guys have with everybody that's on the show, you know, your origin story a little bit. Um, so I'll leave, I'll leave out the bit how I ended up as an MMA fighter, um, because that's, I've talked about that, you know, so much that it's, I don't, it's not even interesting to me, but being a fighter itself is something that I was aware of when I was six, seven years old, when somebody tried to pick on me and my, my reaction always was, well, you're gonna have to earn that. Yep. Right? You're gonna talk to me that way, you're gonna have to earn that. And that was before, there's no reason for me to have felt that. There's no, I wasn't, you know, I, uh, uh, I wasn't exposed to violence as a kid. My family is nice. Like, it's just, it's, it's what I am. It's what I am. Yeah. It's not what I do, it's what I am. Um, and I found a way to incorporate that into everything that I've done from that point. But I, but I knew before I knew how to read that I was a fighter. You know, Amen. like that's, uh, uh, that's just, just me. Yeah, you told me one time that um, that it's not something I do; it's who I am. One hundred percent. You know, and that's I, always stuck with me. I you know, where I said that. I said that to you in Afghanistan. I said that, that, that we were talking on the um, um, that plane, the the the, uh, the second one with no windows, where we all had to face inward. Oh, the military, the Hercules. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that was cool. Yeah, it's so interesting thing. Um, granted, me and Rory are from the same kind of area. We didn't really meet until uh, Afghanistan. So we both got uh, a rare opportunity to go fight a professional mixed martial arts fight uh, at Kandahar Airfield in front of like the Canadian Army and all the NATO forces as like a, a week of entertainment. And it's, uh, it's probably the greatest fighting experience I've still had. I've had a lot of really great ones, but that was so unique yeah. and such a unique experience when we that got was, to that. that. That was my favorite. And honestly, I mean, we're friends because of it. Yeah. So that was the downside. The upside, is that <laughs> the upside is that I got to go to Afghanistan, and the downside is buoyant. <laughs> it's a pretty both downside. But it was, it, was, it was super, super cool. It was super cool. You know, Afghanistan is something I've read about so much. Uh, Alexander the Great uh, may be the last person that successfully invaded Afghanistan, oh. right? And he did it by, not by conquering, but by intermarrying into all the, the tribes. He would have his officers take a wife in every village so that you became blood brothers with with the, with, with the tribes mm -hmm. and every other invading force, uh, um, the Farrell. British. Well, the UK, yeah, exactly. Uh, the British, they they sent an entire battalion, and one man came back. One man wandered out at, uh, from the desert after. Yeah, it's it's scary. And they probably uh, let that guy uh, let live so that he could tell the story. <laughs> that it, it was partly that and partly just luck that he that he was able to make it through the desert. Any books on this? About tons, his story? Tons. About him specifically, though? Um, I can't remember his name, uh, but yes, because most of what we know about the Anglo-Afghan war is because he came back and said, this is what happened. Yeah, that sounds like um, sort of lone survivor-ish type vibes. It's, it's, it's really, guy. really interesting. They call Afga uh, Afghanistan the graveyard of empires. 
right? Because wow. the, 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 the UK, that was the first step towards their eventual collapse. The Soviet Union invaded in the 80s. Yeah. Um, and, and they I mean, warned everybody, on, don't go on, there. On how you perceive the modern United States, uh, the invasion of, of Afghanistan. That was and, uh, it's, I mean, it's, in, in the terms of that they put it as the st strategy of what they're trying to accomplish, it's a failure. It's in a that huge sense. failure. In the, way, in, the way, in the way they present it to the public. What's crazy to me is they understood that deeply as a foreign issue policy. They advocated for supporting the Taliban in the 80s because they wanted this, uh, this sucking chest wound of a war for the Soviet Union that would just drain resources, drain yeah. men. And it's almost like they willingly got win. into something like well, that. Well, that seems to be, we, I mean, we can get on a real tangent on that, but that seems to be a problem that we've had uh, a lot of places, right? Uh, and let's not forget Syria, where most of the world's opium comes from, you know? So there's lots of interest in, in Afghanistan. But what, what you said uh, in the beginning about a fighter, there's one place that definitely makes you earn it. And, uh, and the Afghan people and the Afghan culture, like the, that, that mentality, the fighter mentality, like... You don't have to earn this. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're Afghans, and I don't mean this to be disrespectful at all, but they're like mountain goats. They're just a uh, hardy, they live in yeah. one yeah. of the most arid, difficult places to survive on Earth. And like they Dagestan. There for, yeah, D thing. Dagestan and Chechens. You know, it's funny, uh, my, own, my own family comes from the Scottish Highlands, and at the time when my family left the Highlands, it was Dagestan. It, yeah. was, it was a third world country where people fought for honor, yeah. uh, and, it's, and, it, and it tends to produce scrappy, hard-nosed people. I read a great book about the decline of boxing in the United States that, that directly correlated with the decline of ghettos, right? The decline of, of, of blue-collar uh, people that, that have other options. If you need to get punched in the face, it makes a lot more sense to uh, you know, be a lawyer or a, or a dentist if that's available to you. This well, is why Brazilians sports. are such killers. And when I went down to Brazil and I saw like these guys are fighting to get out of the favelas, yeah. there's not too many options. Either you know you're what? selling drugs, you're playing soccer, the, or the you're interesting, fighting. The interesting thing about combat sports in particular, and I learned this with the, the Cuban wrestling team, you don't need fucking anything to be to be the best. No, those guys practice on the beach. They it's go wrestle at, at barefoot. Uh, Daniel Agali, the, the the Canadian gold medalist, yeah. learned learned to, to wrestle uh, on the savanna in Africa the yeah. same way the same way that um, Agia Sassuri, our uh, Georgian silver medals. Both those guys, their childhood, instead of having pick up uh, a basketball or hockey where you needed equipment, they'd go down to a sand pile or a wood chip pile and fight all the other kids all day. That was their that was their game. I think that's what always attracted me to the idea of fighting. Is that it was like like you said, you don't not only do you not need a team, but like it's literally up to you internally. Like, when we look at this whole Khabib story, like, when you think about where he's from, it's like, you know what I mean? Like, it does not he's matter how bears. fancy yeah, it, the person he's fighting, the, what they the, come if from. He like, was, if he was less, less ethnically threatening to the United States, I think he would be the the hero of the United States. Describe a man that has pulled himself up but from the butch, butch, uh, bootstraps more. And he, like, he's fucking Davy Crockett. He wrestled a bear. Yeah, literally. Like, that, that, guy, that guy literally could be an American folk, folk but his, hero. But his father was, like, a big deal within the government because he used to train a lot of their uh, soldiers. I know, like, the story is that if his yeah. father is, like, really the goal, like, the idea it's, is that they've always his said father's His father's really, like, the Davy Crockett. Yeah, they literally said that his father, if he had these opportunities, would have been even more of a killer than him. Like, he was more, like, pedigreed in judo. Like, he yeah, was but there was just really no, that there was guy. No, uh, there was no global opportunity to show that off. And especially to make money. Before, it, you're just doing Even it for now. glory. So this is the perfect segue to a question I wanted to ask you that I kind of mm -hmm. already brought up. And let's just get right into it because this is an MMA podcast. We all know what happened to Conor McGregor and um, his loss to Dustin Poirier. Um, you know, we can get into the pains about it. But this is something I want to ask directly about Khabib. Do you believe Khabib can be considered the greatest UFC fighter ever if he never challenges for another weight class, in a, for a belt in another weight class? For instance, if Israel Adesanya beats Jan, mm -hmm. can we really call a guy who never left his weight class the greatest? And secondly, his biggest win, can we all agree, is Connor? Um, now, Max, I know from a, from a semantical standpoint. Max, I mean, not, not uh, in no, terms of... No, for Khabib, I mean. Oh, uh, the, the, he fought Holloway, didn't he? No, uh, Poirier beat Holloway. Oh, that's right, that's right. Yeah, you're thinking yeah, about yeah. But can, So is it fair to say Khabib, his biggest win is Connor? It definitely gave yeah. me the most notoriety. Yeah. I mean, so here's and here's here's the one exception that I have to to, to that that line of reasoning. I think you have to look at the weight class. Well, this is what I was going right? to ask you. So so if you look at 185, Anderson Silva, that's that's the weakest weight class in the UFC for the years that he was champion. Agreed. Totally. And that does. I'm not taking anything away from him. I've said this before. You want to compliment Anderson Silva? I cannot think of a of, of a fighter that that chose the correct weapon at the correct range more often and better than, than Anderson Silva. Agreed. Always correct. Agreed. Always the one that was going to hurt your opponent the most. He was, he was wonderful. But he was, he was fighting 
the worst guys in the UFC comparatively for defending his title. For the weight class. Yeah. Totally the difference in the level if he's talking, And I think it matters. I think context matters. You say, okay, that was a weak weight class. If he goes up or he makes the effort to cut down and fight GSP at 170, well, shit, now, now, now you have a real conversation. But at 155, what's a, name a harder weight class. Well, I so can't think of it. It's the deepest weight class there is. And I think there's that the That we can argue about, but I, this is a semantical question about that. What's a, what's a, what, uh, I would argue right now it's 135. I think 155, so this is what, so, this is what I say. And here's, and here's why I say 55, almost regardless of, of, of who's competing in it at the moment. 155 represents the peak of the, the population graph where yes, the most yes. amount of people fall. I do agree with the athleticism. I totally and agree. I so do you're going to have the most amount of people fall into that range. But mm -hmm. beyond that, I think you get the, the, the best for a fight fan. Let's assume I'm not even a, a fighter. But for a fight fan, the best combination of speed, power, power explosiveness, and, and, and forcing to be intelligent, um, you know, heavyweights don't have to be as smart a fighter as a flyweight. That's it's unfortunate. Uh, flyweights don't have to worry about getting shut off every 30 seconds in a fight. I but agree. 155, you have to worry about everything. You, maybe you do get shut off. Right? So maybe you do get somebody that's... Who would you there. think is... Because I... Right, so if, even if you don't say technically yeah. it's Connor, he's definitely the one that gave him the most popularity. We, that's a yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, can but you... that's not a purist argument, right? So this is my question. If your biggest win is beating a guy who start off at 45, how can you be the GOAT if you've never tried to go up a weight class? We give Connor so much crap for that loss and ignore the fact that he could have stayed at 45 and fought the Ricardo Lamas. Okay, name, the name, name another fighter that is undefeated after 27 MMA fights and yeah. not padding a record. Totally agree. You My know, problem I, is how many champions go that long and don't go up weight If I have grandmother fights? 27 times, I might slip on a banana peel and lose once. But to, right? the point like is, but to the point is, we don't know what happens if, if, I'll give um, you another reason if that Connor I think, never leaves 45. But here's another reason that I think that I think that that, that I would I would argue that Khabib's at least worth discussing without having to go out of the, the, the division. He is, he is worth talking about as well. But I would, say, I would say, I would advocate for him. I think, I mean, this is, this is a jerk off conversation. This it conversation is. happens because it's not objectively measurable. There's no way for, um, you know, uh, say prime GSP 2008 to fight prime Khabib. But this is the, you know so why? We, we have to talk about it forever. You know what the problem is though? What is stopping him from doing it now? Um, legacy. He beat, who, do you, who, do you uh, who do you beat to get his belt? Who do you beat to get his belt? GSP? No, um, Khabib. Uh, I like what No, uh, bro, you were supposed to not say anything because I want to prove. Even a fight guy has a problem remembering it. I, That's I, how he got his belt. Was so, Allied so the, 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 the truth, the truth is, and I'll be, I'll be perfectly frank with this. I don't study the, the, the win losses of of elite level fighters anymore. I'll study their game, but it doesn't. And this, you this, this, this you don't actually, get caught up in the rankings and what. But so isn't that? But don't you the, almost have to when you're talking about what makes somebody a goat? Like, if yes, you're talking about you being the greatest. Yes, don't you have but, to look at their. their but I may not fought? be the, the best person to ask that question to, and it's something that I, that I stumbled across. Um, I've, I've been I've been I've been reading a lot about cognitive function as um, as a part of understanding fighters. I want to understand what you guys think and how your emotion plays on what you think, and how both of those things play in your ability to perform a task under enormous amounts of stress. Right, those, that's, that's sort of uh, uh, what, what interests me. And so I'm studying different ways of decision making, and I stumbled across something called Ariadne's Thread, and it's a reference to uh, Greek mythology. She was the, um, the girl that gave Theseus the thread to help him find his way out of the, the maze with a minotaur, okay? But Ariadne's thread as a, as a, as a logical way of, of solving a problem is algorithmic, which means instead of finding the best, best solution, you find every solution and then choose the best, the best from it. And that really is how my mind works. So the problem that I have uh, evaluating something like this is that I would need to read about every one of those fights, watch it, make notes, think about it, or it's a meaningless argument to me. Yeah. And I cannot give that much of my mental attention to something that really is a jerk off conversation. No, yeah, and but, the, but that, that's not to say that I don't care. Yeah. But, but what's interesting for me as, um, as a fight coach is how that plays on, on strategy and how, how it plays on me as a coach for say, you guys. If, if Boyan told me he was gonna fight a guy 12 months from today and he gave me the guy's name, I think I could come up in 12 months with the best possible solution to that problem. But that's never, that's never the, the well, case. Well, if he's the solution case. 12 months ago, you don't know what that guy's like a year later either. Exactly. That's the thing. The variables are so fluid. And we're not so going to fight fluid. a guy and in we, 12 months. We're going to fight a guy in two months. Yeah, and, and we were just talking about this earlier. Is like people play so much into this, but they don't realize that fighting is when guys meet each other. It's all the stuff leading up to the fight yeah. that matters. You don't know if you catch a guy on... <clears throat> 
just a dark period of of a, a string it's in his I thing. Mean, I've, and you, I've and you be for things studying fighters where I think, look at that, look at that hole in his game. Those fighters aren't stupid. Right, sometimes the thing that you identify as a hole in their game is the thing that they focused on the most. The most. Right now, they're, now instead of their boxing being sloppy and an opportunity to beat them up, you, you get clipped on the way in. Well, to your point about it being a, so let me just say, so I'm a big basketball fan, right? So I think a jack of argument would be uh, Jordan and LeBron. We'll mm -hmm. never, ever, ever, ever know. Khabib, right now, as it stands, has an opportunity to save a division that, I'm sorry, 170 needs a savior. 170 so, so needs a big fight. Let's, how would you sell it to Khabib? You, you're one of, you're considering yourself your grace. Remember at the end of his last fight, he said, I want to be called, considered the best pound for pound. Well, to your point, you said how many guys have gone into fight that long? John Jones. And he's about to go up. If John Jones gets a belt. And I would argue feet, that John Jones is probably pound for pound. If John pound Jones degree. beats either Stipe or Ngano and is undefeated and wins two belts, how can you put Khabib above him? You for know, beating the, Conor McGregor, a guy. Remember, the, the if Conor didn't thing. have those balls to go up to 55, who's Khabib's biggest win? Would, would, would anybody have cared about Khabib if he was a champ for being Ali Quinto? I, I, not, no. <laughs> like, no. Be honest. And, that's, no. and, and I, I like Ali uh, Quinto. I think I he's, I think he's no, a elite level fighter. To be, to be fair, and again, I, uh, uh, I hope this doesn't come across as, as disrespectful, and I mean this as a compliment. I think he has successfully competed at a level that he has no business competing at for a long time. He's got heart. He's got heart, and he's smart, and he works with the right partners. Like, there's, there's... And again, it's so hard to say this without sounding like I'm shit talking him, but but he's taken what are not great materials to begin with and <laughs> turned that into something sure. incredible. Well, so our wrestling coach Neil Uros thinks Connor is the grace because he goes, without Connor, there is no Khabib. Connor did something that you're not willing to do. He okay, put so his, he put so his record at risk. He put his life. He's gone up to three who's weight a, classes. Who's a more successful musician, uh, Led Zeppelin or Muddy Waters? Led Zeppelin, of course. Of course, and it's not even close. Led Zeppelin or, or sorry, uh, Rolling Stones or Muddy Waters? Rolling Stones. Of course, it's not even close. But Muddy Waters was the, the, the root of all those riffs. It was the root yeah. of, of bluesy rock. And, and they Fair. wouldn't exist without him. But that doesn't... That, that but doesn't, again, that's not... You can't measure it objectively. But the reason I'm say. saying is without Connor uh, uh, taking... You, you can't. But there's, there, it's, important, it's important to acknowledge that everybody is, is standing on, on the shoulder of some giant. But yes. the difference between that is... is with Connor didn't, if someone was like, if Connor decides he wants to be a Khabib and never leaves his weight class, what is Khabib? If he decides, I only want to fight at one oh, point. But, but, like, but now you're talking about like how popular so he got. I would, yeah, fighting. I would say, so I would my, say, my, but my point is, my point is, if the guy who you got the most fame had your stance on fighting and decided to never leave his weight class, a lot of guys could do it. Why, like, why is John Jones going up? Why did DC go up? Why did GSP, like, the amount of guys who so my my sense is that 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 for for fighters born and bred in the West, there is a sense of spectacle built into their understanding of fighting, and that they need to be the Conor McGregor sideshow, where where in Dagestan and Chechnya and places like that, your ability to fight defines your your social status, your ability to totally be a man, right. yeah. and it's and it's the opposite end of the spectrum, being stoic and being uh, reserved and being pious and, right. and, and and humble, being respectful to your father is so much more important than any sideshow. And that's why I said sell it to me as Khabib. Because all of the things that you're talking about- Those are not any I selling points. I don't think points. they matter to him. Okay, but you, you and know for what? some reason that makes me like him more. So Roy, yeah. right. but what was his, this is his words. I want you to put me down as the number one pound for pound ever. In so the he UFC. said that after his last fight. You can't say that uh, and then not go- But I, I was his, his father was still alive? No, his father, his father was dead. Um, it was after, and this is, like I said, I agree with everything you guys are saying, but these are his words. If you want to be considered the greatest pound for pound, you, you're telling me we're supposed to put you above John Jones if John Jones gets the second belt? Never lost? And who's, you know who's had more impressive and, wins? And I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell you one of the other things, and this is a knock against John Jones. If he wasn't a fucking idiot, this wouldn't even be a conversation. Yeah, right? if I he agree. was, if he, he to me if is he the had, goal. I just If he had, but I disagree. I disagree. And here's, here's my view as, 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 a, as a fight coach. I have people come in all... The, I'm gonna shit talk Boyan a little bit, but Please in a complimentary yeah, way. Yeah, the guy, the guy has the guy has the the talent of one of these cupcakes. Like I, I I I love you to death, but but athletically you are you are competing against people that were competitive fullbacks uh, in football. It's not it's not a it's you should not be able to do that, but you do. I don't give a fuck about talent or ability. I give a fuck about what you do on the mat. How real you are in a fight, how serious you take this, and how much better you get over your career. I remember you saying, uh, "Just give me pit bulls. I can teach them the rest of the stuff, even if they're lacking." And, and like I, don't like care I was, and you know the in, funny thing is, I learned I learned this uh, the hard way. Pit bulls don't always look like pit bulls, uh, right? Like you're not you're starting to look a little bit more like yeah, one. But, and, but I remember and, when I met you, you were this little 
no cauliflower blonde hair, these Definitely innocent better looking blue kid. eyes. Yeah, and, and you can add, you can even add physical attributes, the things I'm missing. You know what I mean? So it's like, um, <laughs> so I'll be so, fair. John hasn't gone up yet. So I am kind of going against my own argument because to be fair, that was a knock I had for, on John. Oh, but that's, well he's, he's, before committed, he's committed to that. And I, and I, I believe it. I've seen, I've seen, uh, the work that he's done to put on weight. I think yeah. that, I think that's that, that all of that rings true for me, for somebody that wants to move up. And take and this the seriously. Thing about going from light heavyweight to heavyweight, it's a huge jump. Is you're not going 15 or 20 pounds, you're going 50. Six, yeah, right? yeah. Like that's a 60 matter. pounds. Well, I always up to 60 to pounds. Two, two five to two sixty five. Yeah, yeah, right. 60 pounds. 60 pounds. Yeah, that's the highest you can be. But I used to always say, like, listen, this is why I could Francis put, Ngannou is going to be two sixty five. I, I would say John Jones when he watched Conor get that second belt, he had to have been sick knowing how many heavyweights went through that were there in his time that he knew he could have beat. He should have been the first double champ. I don't understand. Uh, heavyweight's could've, such a could've, different could've, game, could've, though. All I'm saying is... Heavyweights, man. Heavyweights are different. It's all such a different game. Ask, ask Daniel Cormier who, who, who he'd rather have to fight again. Another just, heavyweight or John Jones? Tyson, just think about the risk factor at heavyweight. It's, it's so roulette, man. much more. It's Russian roulette. So, so it's, it's, uh, though, why, so how, what does that tell you about Connor? I'll tell, I'll tell you guys, you, you, you want to know an interesting stat, actually? That, that, that really, uh, There's a great book called Fightnomics that breaks down the actual statistics of fighting so it's less... Like how we feel about what we're looking yeah. at. Yeah. So statistically, a heavyweight is likely to be dropped every round. That's exactly. over over the course of a fight, which means some fights, you know, some guys are dropped five times, but but not others. Some guys dropped once and in it's a, over. So once a round, that's the average. The average in flyweight, it's once every other fight. That makes sense. It's it's three and a half rounds between when they get dropped. It is a different sport. The different it's sport. not just I agree. it's not just different skill sets and different weight classes. As you shift. It is. It becomes a different sport. You're, you're moving. Playing. You're moving through like reality totally differently. You, and uh, you were. You were at the uh, Jones's fight against Gust Gustafson, right? Yes. Okay. Oh I, I was. God. I was in. Right? His, I was in his change room. I was coaching uh, Jesse Ronson, and I, and I was in his change room for, for that fight before and after the fight. I saw him come back after fighting Gustafson, holding that belt like somebody was going to take it away from him. Yeah. Because he got the shit kicked out of him. And Gustafson has accuracy, but not a ton of power. Right, you put those uppercuts, you put that jab, and you sit down on a right Anthony hand with somebody Johnson. that weighs 265 pounds. If they don't have to hit you that hard when you're 265 pounds. And he plays it's going to be hard he, anyway. You know, Jones plays this this this, this pitter patter game uh, with guys that are that are bringing a fucking howitzer to the to the. To the yeah. game. it's not. It's. I wouldn't say that that unequivocally it's an easy transition to heavyweight. No, I don't. Uh, I don't say. In some ways, I think I think Jones would actually have an easier time trying to cut down to 85 than trying to bump up to. Well, my point is now he now that he's finally doing it. I, all my this is my argument for Connor. Connor was talking about willing to fight Kamaru Usman. He started off mm. as a 145er. Mm. He's taken losses uh -oh. already. We've seen him that's get out. That's a terrible but matchup for Connor. But, so, but that's a terrible matchup for the fans too. So no, but let this sink in. Let this sink gonna, in. You just said it. He's, it's going to be like watching a, a seal try to slowly jump over another seal and not quite make it for 15 minutes. <laughs> Every one of his losses, he's Dry got taken down. <laughs> Even the poor if I got taken out. And the man still has the balls to want to test himself like that. You've never even been dropped in a fight, Khabib. And you don't even want to see. And remember, Khabib's missed weight four times in UFC. He's not a small 55er. Connor's never guy. missed weight. And he's willing to fight at 170. I just, for instance, let me, this is a perfect conversation. Uh, okay, who's so, the better heavyweight? Mike Tyson is prime or Muhammad Ali? Oof, wow. Uh, this is a jerk off conversation, but watch yeah, what I yeah. do with it. Um, I like jerk off conversations. Um, it depends on your criteria. Do you mean the better boxer or are you saying who would have won? Okay, that's a good question. Are you saying who would have won in a fight between those two prime athletes or are you saying who is more dominant as the heavyweight athlete in their respective areas? So I'm saying overall because Tyson himself called Ali greater. He goes, I may have had a better record. He maybe goes, it was his ability to come back. It was the way he took three years off. It was all, this is Tyson saying this about himself. But now you're factoring so many things. Like, what's more important? Somebody being yeah. undefeated and perfect exactly. or, or somebody falling, getting so down, and coming back? Like, what's, what do you value more? If you never took a risk. You've, you've missed the weight. We know you're a big 55-er. You've, you've dominated everybody. So you've never, you've that's, never but even you're, taken you're, a risk. You're making, a, you're making an assumption there. First, first of all, he has taken a risk. He's, he's fought the best guys on earth in his division. I'm talking within the as a fighter. Fighting is a risk. He's, not, he's not taking an... So, but, but let's put this, what you just said, into perspective, because this, this is important that we keep coming back to this. What you just said is that he hasn't taken a risk by going out of his weight class because he's beat the shit out of every single person that's been put in front of him. Uh, it doesn't seem like he, there, there's a need to, to, to move on to something else. 
Uh, and not only that, the other thing that I, that I think is even more compelling about Khabib that, that maybe uh, pushes him up in this conversation, everybody knows exactly what he's going to do. Yep. Exactly. Like that's, but that's more impressive than being surprised by some freak athlete that can do anything. He could, he, he, I could write out step by step in an email what he is going to do to you and send it to you six so months before it happens. Yeah, let's just and he still does it. Yeah. What can so, be, so, what's so, more so impressive let's, as let's, a fighter? Let's, let's shift conversations about that. And you, you were mentioning like, the thing that impresses you most about Khabib is the way he has priorities and that he never deviates from yes. them. Yes. You know, and, and, and yeah, man, exactly. My man's been paying attention. I like that. Yeah, I mean, I so, said that I, but I said that in practice. So yeah. Yeah. I, I used to knock Jones for this because I, I said like, I think the only reason he's going up now is because there's how many mm. now double champs. I don't think he goes up if it wasn't for, look at what Adesanya's doing. They having all this beef. You don't think it's going to bother him a little bit if Adesanya is, becomes is, a double champ? This is an interesting train of thought that I just, that I just had. So, um, I coach differently than I than I compete. Okay, and I've and, heard that about you. Very, times. very, very <laughs> much so. He says that he like you know he doesn't take any of that advice. I'm like I like the advice though. I'm okay, so so but but think about it this way. I am I, I thrive in chaos. I I, uh, I I try to create situations that are chaotic, that are difficult to understand, and I'm ready to attack anything that shows up in those environments. But that's that's I can't I can't teach somebody else to do that. Okay. I can teach somebody else to deeply understand a system to the point where they're able to express their own personality within that system. That's the best that I can do. But, but the, the way I've thought about it, I'm the joker and I'm teaching people how to be the Batman. Right? That's, that's, that's what I want. I want people that, that are systemic, what that are deliberate, lie. that have priorities, that are focused, that make choices about uh, uh, something they decided when they were 10 years old that this is what I'm going to be. And every choice they make in their life is geared towards that. And I am not that person. <laughs> And I, 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 I'm serious, I love that. I love but, that, but no. it's, it's, it's a self-realization that I can be a good coach and I can build that in people because I recognize the importance and not be that person myself because I've tried to, to teach people what I do and it's, it's too chaotic. There's no, there's no, uh, uh it's like being thrown in the deep end uh, and being told to swim. Well, you may not even like fighting if you were forced to fight that way. For some I would have hated it. Yeah. I, I think some people, it. that's the point. I think. Oh. I, I think that's, that's, the but that's his, uh, his, uh, one of the thing about your coaching style that you always talk about is that you're like a dictator in the beginning and that like you give this rigid system and it's like, you have to follow these rules and you almost set like strict rules for, for fighting. Yeah. Once someone understands those rules, then you're they can to begin to bend deviate, and bend and break and that's, break through the matrix. That's and an that's when the that personality I, that I from, from John Donner, that's, I, I got to give credit there. That's, that's a quote that he said. And I love the idea of it because when you're beginning, you really need to deeply absorb the system. You really, really need to understand it so that you can discard it, right? So that eventually you can let it go and understand why you're making the choices that you are. But if you don't start with a deep understanding of the system, what you're doing is, is uh, throwing shit at a wall and hope, and hope something sticks. Yeah. When you make a conscious choice to break a rule because you understand the consequences and the benefits and you've made a choice to exist outside that system, that for me is one of the biggest check marks that tell me this person is starting to understand fighting. Not where it's just some random thing that they do, but they say, you know, listen, coach, I know this is wrong. I know, I know I shouldn't do this, but here's why I did it. And here's why it worked. Yeah. yeah. Fucking right. That's the fighter that I want to train. That's, that's, I that's who I, that's what I'm trying to generate. And that's when I start seeing process. opportunities in chaos. It's only after once I start understanding the order of it, mm. you know, it's one of the things that I, that I love, love, uh, uh, about the Joker and the, the, the Christopher Nolan Joker is that he, you know, he's not a bad guy in the movie. And I know, and I know that's weird to say, but if you look at what he does, he undermines the police and Batman just as much as he undermines the criminals. He burns half their money. He wants to hamper the systems to see what happens. Yeah. And fuck me, man. That's what I like about fighting. No, right? I want, I want a I like little that. bit of chaos, and I want, to, I want to see what happens. So what do you think of a guy like Israel Adesanya who's making this risk so fast in his career? Because to me, I'm like, I, I have so much respect for a guy mm -hmm. who still a lot of fights for him to be made. Um, he's looked amazing. He has nothing to prove yet. I don't think he has any reason to go up. It is purely, uh, he wants to take himself to a level that... And I just, I just think mm. you have to have that. You have to have that uh, Muhammad Audacity. Ali in you. Yeah. Audacity, yeah. I just think you have to have that a little bit in you to be the greatest of all time. I don't think, and you, you especially are, when you're you winning describing. so, I don't want to say easily. Let me, because what he does, listen, to do that to anybody is amazing, right? What Khabib has done. But when it's, when it's coming to you that way in such a system, I'm sorry, I'm going to say it again. The best wrestler he fought was Justin Gaethje. Who but he wrestle. cut through. He cut through him like. But does he? You know what? You know what's he funny. You're, you're touching on something that I really do agree with, which is I think the mythology 
behind the fighter. Yes. And, and you know, you talk about uh, uh, Muhammad Ali with the, the rumble in the jungle, the mythology, because he went into that fight. I don't know if you guys have ever watched the, the movie um, uh, we, were we Were Kings. We were Kings. Oh, Amazing my, movie. Oh, awesome. God. And if you, if you really want to geek out on it, Norman Mailer wrote a book uh, called The Fight, which is sort of the literary version of, 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 of that movie. But people thought he was going to die in that fight. Yeah. People, people thought he was going to get beaten to death four years. So really. uh, and and Rightfully if so. I was if I was a boxing analyst at the time, you would have said the, the same thing. The hardest hitting puncher of all time, and he was a scary man. He it was, was right terrifying. after he knocked out Joe Frazier, right? So, bro, I didn't know how and serious Frazier he was. Was uh, the the a fight killer. that that, that, that almost, almost killed retired, Ali, almost retired, almost Ali, killed him, broke his jaw. So I didn't know Foreman was like that until seeing the thing. All I remember him and not to be funny. The Foreman was, Grill, yeah, I just the, remember the, the, big the happy. fat happy old man. Do you know he sold the Foreman Grill for 137 million dollars? I'm so it's happy. He's, he's he is still significantly wealthier because of the Foreman Grill than he was because of I'm his I'm so happy for him. So and happy. you know, he has like 12 kids that and then, all and then he could afford his daughter. George, Georgina, George. Uh, George. I love that guy. I love, that I, love I really do though. It, and it is cool because after he lost that fight, he showed up there, he had an Afro, he had, um, and they, they talk about it in the movie. He showed up with German shepherds, which in Africa at the time were, was a symbol of it colonialism was, it was as the Belgians used the swastika. It. Yeah. yeah, that's what the, that's what co uh, colonizers used to terrorize us. And he got off the plane with two of them, right? And people were like, "Yeah, yeah I we, couldn't believe that." And I was then, like, this and then is he pops George. back up in the '90s, still the hardest hitting man on earth. Knocks on Michael Moore, <laughs> so, like a Southern Baptist is gonna cook you a barbecue after he kicks his shit. Completely out of your dad. bald. Yeah, like, it reminded me of like Homer Simpson when he knocked him out oh. too. Like that one point, you just like, uh, Dreader Forty five years old. <laughs> He's not getting tired, Homer. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what he reminded me of when, he, and so when I saw that movie, I was like, "This is not who I pictured him he, being." It was he beat uh, fuck, what's his name? Moore, the only left-handed heavyweight champion of all time uh, and ever, and he was and he was trained at the time by Teddy Atlas, and Teddy Atlas He's is the, the only guy Southpaw heavyweight champion ever. Uh, and George Foreman knocked him out with a straight right hand, right on the button. So if all those, because I know Usyk's going up, so if he wins, he'll be the second then. The, the, oh, wow. Yeah. That is, see, this stuff is stats you just don't, um, Rory knows this And stuff. Teddy yeah. Atlas, who's an interesting guy, Teddy Atlas, Teddy Atlas. Um, Mike Tyson, when, when he was uh, an up-and-coming boxer, was talking to Teddy Atlas's daughter or stepdaughter got or something. It was, it was, it was, I think it was and Teddy, Teddy Atlas got took a, took a, a revolver gone. and put it in Mike Tyson's mouth and said, if you, if you ever talk to my... This girl who's attached to me, I'll, I'll, I'll shoot you. Oh, they had beef for like decades. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah. Like he, to yeah. this day. Teddy like, was the one that says Mike Tyson wasn't a good fighter because. They just recently got over that beef. Teddy Atlas, like, if you ever recently, watched like the, last the year. HBO, he's the guy that used to do the breakdowns. And I he sounds his, like, the, man. like the, the most classic old school. He sounds like a gangster. He does. And his nose is like, you know, he's just. This. He's like the cliche standard for boxing coaches. You oh, know? when you hear the story yeah. about that Mike Tyson thing. Okay. He's got the hat, he's got the everything. When you hear that story of the Mike Tyson story, you're like, oh, you're one of those guys that you didn't get into boxing. You would, they'd been writing stories about you in like Hell's Kitchen. Like you. Like Tyson, Mike Tyson, Tyson, at Tyson, that wouldn't, time? Tyson wouldn't have lived past twenty if if uh, if, if Custom Custom Auto, yeah. hadn't hadn't looked after him. Of course, everyone knows uh, that. Um, also, I just wanted to because we did talk about this beforehand. Yes. The Warriors poster. I, I told you I was going to tell you something really interesting with this. Yeah, so, Fallon, so, tell us more about your favorite movie, The Warriors. It's a great movie. <laughs> Come it's a great out movie. to play. Movie. You just you just like the, the leather vests. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're awesome. So, what yeah. were you going to tell us? This movie was actually based on a book written by one of the students of Socrates, and his name was Xenophon. He wrote a book called The Anabasis, and after the Peloponnesian War, where Athens and Sparta fought essentially a Greek civil war, and, and Sparta won, they crushed democracy, uh, and they put 30 tyrants in charge of Athens. But all the, the soldiers and the generals that had fought, uh, the, the, the generation that followed Socrates, his children, sort of, um, were military men, born, born and bred. So Xenophon took 10,000 Greeks and traveled to Persia and became um, a, as a mercenary force. And while they were in Persia, the man that they were fighting for was killed in the first battle. He was, he was beheaded. And then nobody's paying them. So there's 10,000 Greeks in the middle of Persia, and they have to get back to Greece on foot while they're being attacked by all these crazy different cultures that they're walking through north of the Black Sea, um, so when you see this movie, 
the warriors are the Greeks <gasps> trying to get back to Staten Island through New York with all these different neighborhoods where they're being attacked. Right. By I'm watching that tonight. You got me to it watch is, uh, uh, Last Samurai. The last time I'm watching this tonight. Money. Now. But yeah, and it's such a weird thing. Where You're I'm my like, go-to guy for movies. But now. I couldn't believe that because this is, if you haven't seen the movie, where's the, the camera? It's the cheesiest. Slap the yourself cheesiest immediately. 70, yeah. but I love it. I love it. It's oh, a great, it's a great movie. movie. Can I even had the video game. It? Can you yes. dig it? Fucking oh, awesome. I'm watching the close up on, uh, on the lips. <laughs> I'm um, watching that tonight. The radio? But, the radio? Uh, and... What's the name? Sorry, that was that was. That's I, but, I just I, I, excited I, I, to see I it. But what's what's? Do you remember? Uh, this is this is a quiz, and see if see if we can piece this together. Do you remember the name of the the bad guy, um, uh, black guy with the glasses and the long robe? That's sort of the head of of, of oh, the, the rival gang. Oh my god, that's such a classic scene too. I don't. Cyrus. Cyrus, that's right. Cyrus gets killed. And and Cyrus, over 10 years. the king of Cyrus Persia. Cyrus the Great. Was the man uh, that was the father of Xerxes, and Xerxes is the one that invaded in three hundred. Yeah. In three hundred, but Cyrus the Great gets King you Leonidas. might know this gets the best press in the Bible. He was enormously protective over Jews. He gave them religious freedom. He let them live in Persia without persecution for the first time. So, so uh, 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 the the Old Testament loves Cyrus the Great. Uh, That's what they call him. The Great. Interesting, where you see this the the the. the uh, two uh, fundamental pillars of Western civilization starting to butt heads because Greek culture despised the Persians. Yeah. These are these are the the the, the people that, that are the antithesis of freedom, the antithesis of democracy. And then that runs into the Old Testament view that these were the people that loved freedom the most in the ancient world. And so you said Cyrus was Xerxes' father. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Cyrus the Great. And they make a little nod to that in uh, in uh, yeah. Warriors to have uh, Cyrus. 300 is literally like one of my favorite movies of all time. Like, I don't care. Like, I've always said my first son's name will be Leonidas. It's not, a, it's, not a, it's not a terrible name. Facts. Um, terrible. Facts you, so let, let, me, let me ask you this. Let me ask you a question. Me, uh, what do you like about Le, uh, Le, Leonidas? So I, I remember just watching the movie and the story, and I, I just remember the scene where it kind of reminded me of like the thing about the wrestling team in Cuba. I would say I want to send my son to wrestle in Cuba because you have to like wrestle for your food. Yeah. I remember the scene where they send him off into the forest and he has to come back a king. Mm. And that just I remember just being in the theater and that like resonating for me. Like the idea that you have to... The, the idea, first, they throw away any kids that are weak. So right, already you're already of a tougher breed. Mm. And then to be king, you have to get shipped off into the... Now, who knows how accurate the story of his age well, was. So here's, here's what I like. 14 here's, years uh, old, killing a wolf. It just... I was, I was in college. It wasn't... It, just, it, was, it wasn't... It wasn't it wasn't too far off reality, I'll, right? I'll, 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 there's a couple ideas I want to present to you because this is actually something that I studied uh, deeply in, in university. I, I, I love Greek culture. I wrote my undergrad thesis about how... Uh, Greek military sport, combat sports were used to train the military in the ancient, in the ancient world. Boxing, wrestling, and pancreation, uh, and, and how they were used to train. But one of the things that I found when I was 19, 20, 21, 300, yeah, um, there's a great book by uh, Stephen Pressfield called The Gates of Fire. They actually have uh, Marine Corps officers read this book, and it's all about Leonidas, but it's like 300, but, but better and deeper. I lost an enormous amount of respect for Sparta and what it represented as I started to understand what they actually were. And, and what's important about 300 is what you're seeing is propaganda. That I know, is, that, I know. Is, that is one Spartan man I telling know. another His Spartan story. army a story. Yeah, and I so know. That's, why, that's why the Persians look like monsters. Yeah. And that's why, that's why uh, Leonidas at 14 goes out into the wilderness and kills a wolf. He's, he's selling something. I, I would put forward that Sparta is the is a combination of the Confederates and the Soviets in one in one culture. They produced no art. They produced no philosophy. They produced yeah, uh, 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 no culture, and they weren't even that good at, at fighting. Most of it was just their own propaganda. They were as likely to lose as they were to win. There's things about their culture that I that I fundamentally do not respect. They wouldn't participate in combat sports in the Olympics. Right, because they could stand losing a foot race to an Athenian, but if you beat me up with uh, with punches, I have well, to kill you. now, well, yeah, but not that's the thing though. They wouldn't. They just <laughs> they want They want they they want you to think that that's I'm so badass. And what they said is, you guys fight, but but you don't let me uh, them use. Uh, you, you're, there's no biting. There's no eye gouging. Uh, there's no there's no clawing. Yeah. Lions use their teeth and claws. That was that, that was the argument. It's horseshit. They just yeah, didn't want that is to lose. a bad argument. I agree. They, they didn't want to lose politically. On top of that, the reason they had a standing army is because they were outnumbered by their slaves. 
They captured a city next to them and enslaved every man, woman, and child and forced them to do the physical labor and the, the maintenance of their houses. So they had to be as trained as possible to because be at any given time. Do you know why they you only sent 300? You're going to love my second reason for but, uh, but this is so but, fucked up. They only sent 300 despite knowing this is an existential threat because a, a, an even more existential threat was the was slave slaves. slaves. See, that's that part of the story I didn't know. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's bananas. And, and yet we somehow take only the sacrifice part. Yeah. Only the fact that 300 of those fucking idiots were willing to die and 40,000 of them said, well, mm, I like slaves a lot. So you're so laughing at my second reason because you're a wrestler, right? So you, you how, 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 when did you start wrestling? How old were you? Mm. Uh, grade nine, so 14, 13. Okay, so you remember like uh, when there'd be the brackets and there was like the kid who was number one and you'd go look at the bracket and you'd see yeah. the name. And remember, you ever remember going and seeing like a name and like you didn't know who it was? I so This is literally since high school where after seeing this movie, I was like, if my son's name is Leonidas says, I imagine like, yeah. imagine being a kid, yeah, you have yeah, to go yeah. wrestle, it's like Leonidas John Smith fuck. versus Leonidas Tyson. Like, who the fuck we, is Leonidas? we actually, it's funny, my, so I'm still friends with a lot of the guys that I wrestled through in, in high school. And the, when, when a boy's born, they'll, they'll send, a, send a name and everybody's like, I wouldn't want to wrestle that kid. That yeah, it's like that's well, you're exactly. right. It's like like uh, like what like Brock Calder. You're like oh, that sounds like uh, that so sounds like a guy sounds, who wrestles. That sounds like fucking tough guy. So perfect example. He's a he's a, a fighter in Bellator now. So uh, Sean Bunch, he changed to Don or Clyde That looks like that guy yeah. probably right. Ugh. So he was uh, he was in the same division me as high school. This is before he was an MMA fighter. He was a two time champ. So you knew if you're on the same size as him, you're screwed, right? And mm -hmm. I just, you always remember when you went to a tournament. Where am I? Okay, I might get two wins and then I'm running a bunch, right? And I remember my senior year, I got to like be that guy, like guy you didn't want to be. And I remember thinking to myself, like, I didn't wrestle until high school. I planned my son wrestling, like, and like obviously I'm not gonna raise him exactly like a Spartan, right? Maybe just send him to Cuba. There's maybe well, not, there's, maybe there's, not like the forest. Let's go to Cuba for a little Maybe he doesn't have to kill a wolf. But the or idea of a, of a kid okay, with got, the last name Tyson named Leonidas, and you're like, you imagine your father and your son's name, whatever. I've got, I've like, got a better, I've got something better uh, the, 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 to, to, to raise your son and push him towards wrestling better than Sparta. Okay, if you read The Republic by Plato. Plato said the, the ideal sport for a citizen to participate in is wrestling, right? Because wrestling trains your mind as much as it does your body. It, totally makes, you, it makes you understand strategy and yeah. leverage and it's purpose. Just... And he said, in, in addition to that, when you box or you do something like pancreation, which was MMA, it, it, can, it can inflame uh, martial vices is, is, is how he described it. And martial vices are things like bloodlust. Right, where, where you want to smash somebody. Just to see the pain, yeah. Wrestling is about control. It's about strength, control, Total and dominance. your opinion. Yeah. But you, you, I've said this before, you, you can't hurt your, your, your opponent legally in wrestling. It's all about control. Well, you almost always fight. have to be the better wrestler to win a wrestling match. And uh, so play guys get upset, but you can get upset. Like, Rockman versus Lance Lewis. It just comes down to your heavyweight argument. You don't necessarily have to be the better fighter to win a boxing match. You can get that one punch and just... Well, yeah, that, that was... You, uh, uh, you know, uh, boxing, bo uh, boxing is, is, is a boxing match, not a punching match, but punching matters. Don't know what to get your top bitch for Valentine's Day? Well, stop jerking around and get that pussy tingling. This ain't just no ordinary chocolate. Don't forget to subscribe. Hey, we're back to Thick Boy Fight Club. And yeah, I was even uh, going to say, I remember that quote, uh, Socrates says that an average wrestler is, uh, is way superior than the most outstanding runner. It's true. Yeah, that's... Uh, and actually, what's, what's really interesting to get some, it's some of the, the actual history of wrestling. Uh, I'll give you one because uh, I know you got, you got people you're training. A wrestler invented progressive overload training. Uh, Milo of Croton was supposed to be the most uh, successful wrestler in ancient world. What I, was, what I find fascinating is measures of strength at a time where there were no standard weights and measures. So how do you say this guy was, was super strong? So a couple things. First, progressive, the pr progressive overload training, he would pick up a calf and carry it around uh, its field every day. And he kept doing it until it was an ox. So every day was a little bit bigger and a little bit heavier. And so he was able to grow, gain strength every day Wait, until he was oh. carrying an ox around. But they also said he could hold an apple and push his index finger all the way through it, almost like no resistance. And he could hold an egg in his hand, and you would be equally unable to make him crush it or to me even move a finger away from the egg. Uh, and then he said he could stand on a brass shield that had been covered in butter uh, barefoot, and you would not be able to move him. You would not be able to push him off. And that's how they measured his. That's some his, functional training right there. But, but it's yeah, but it's so right? interesting where it's like, what? Fashion, how did they even fashion, talk about that fashion. when you couldn't say, oh, he can bench, you know, whatever, two hundred fifty pounds? Uh, there's no, there was no objective measure. So they say, 
he could push his finger through an apple. And you have an idea of what that would require in terms of bone structure strength. It's, it's, it's fascinating. That is awesome. Milo uh, Froton, a uh, six-time Olympic champion, including a jun junior Olympics, uh, one, of the, one of the most winning uh, wrestler in Olympic history, world history, both uh, ancient and modern. Yeah. Um, well, guys, this is a guy who we're going to have on a lot more, just like Melissa. Like, um, we love this conversation. I really wish we had more time. Uh, but we will be having Rory, a.k.a. John Malkovich, uh, back on. Yeah, it's like opening so, the Pandora's box of ideas with Rory. So well, I've got. Uh, we'll definitely uh, make a longer form for the next one because we definitely could do this for like all less time. less successful Don King and less masculine <laughs> Charlie Hunnam. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we're out for Thick Boy Fight Club. <laughs>